This week's episode of our show is sponsored by a very good friend of ours, Dungeon Scribe, who has just launched their latest Kickstarter, the Tome of Magical Oddities. This tome includes over 500 new magic items fully illustrated to bring to life at your game. These magic items are both fun and quirky, with some examples like the Manual of Infernal Contracts that lets you bind a devil to your service. Available either as a book of magic items or cards that you can hand out and give it to your players at the table, Dungeon Scribe has really put a lot of thought and attention to detail into what makes magic items so interesting and what makes magic item cards useful as a gameplay accessory. This project is actually very special to us because we are very good friends with the creator Dungeon Scribe. We love hanging out with him at all the conventions. We've kept in touch with him for years. And if you want to get your hands on a project that we recommend, we think that he does incredible work and you should definitely check this project out. There are not enough interesting and fun magic items in the core rules of 5th edition. And so if you really want to enhance your game by magic items that have been created by an amazing artist and designer, check out Dungeon Scribe's Kickstarter for the Tome of Magical Oddities right down below. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. The Roving Band of Questing Knights is a staple of fantasy. Whether you are looking at the myths of Arthurian legend or the films of Monty Python, <laughs> you will find countless examples of groups of valiant warriors filled with purpose and swearing oaths coming together to embark on an epic quest against evil. So today we're going to make our own roving band of knights and look at a party of all paladins with so many different knightly orders that they could be from and so many different oaths that they could be swearing, what makes the strongest paladin party? For the purposes of this video, we are looking at a group of four characters. All of them have to play paladins, no multi-classing. And they all have to be from different oaths. For the purposes of these videos, we like to pick different subclasses. Although we'd love to have a band of all vengeance paladins, it might not be the strongest option. I, I would love to have a band of all hexblade paladins as, as well. In 5th edition, paladins are one of the strongest classes, and they are also the fulcrum for a lot of multi-class combos. So this is this episode is an example of why, through the other What If Everyone Plays in X videos, we've said no multi-classing, because I feel like it just takes it to a whole other level as soon as you involve that. In any case... We're also going to be looking at how the party works from 1st all the way to 20th level. How it deals with a variety of situations from combat, exploration, and social interaction. Because if everyone's playing the same class, it's going to bring some strengths, but it's also going to bring some pretty big weaknesses. And then finally, we're going to look at the style points behind the party as a whole. What are some cool campaign concepts, adventure ideas, or character ideas that you could explore when everyone is playing the same class? What we found so far is from our previous videos on the Wizards and Clerics is despite everyone playing the same base class, you can end up with a lot of space for creativity and really, really interesting builds and tactical combinations. So let's see how well the Paladins do because we will give them an overall ranking comparing them to, I think we gave the, the Wizards the S tier so far. I don't know where the Paladins are going to rank up, but it's going to be pretty high. For both of us, Paladins have been one of our favorite classes in the yeah. entire game. 5th edition has really brought them up a few notches, and I still think that a single Paladin in a party is a game changer. So what does four Paladins mean? There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get smiting. So Paladins are a strength and charisma based class, and at third level, all our Paladins are going to swear their oath, which is going to give them an expanded spell list which is going to be really critical for a party of all paladins because the expanded spell list is going to give this party options at, that would not normally be available to every single member of the party. Everyone's going to be smiting. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's going to have an aura of protection starting at 6th level. But there's a bit of a problem with this. Aura of protection does not stack. This actually applies to any ability that is the same name in Dungeons and Dragons do not stack over top of each other. So although you might be sitting here thinking, wow, my aura of protection in a party of all paladins, I'm going to have like a plus 20 
to uh, my saving throws. That's not the case. But this means that whoever has the best charisma score in this party can bolster the entire party up. It also means that if your party is split for any reason and in separate areas on the battlefield, you still do have the benefits of everybody receiving a bonus of some sort. So, but I do think that that is an important consideration for our all paladin party is that not every one of the characters in the party is going to have to completely max their charisma out. It might be fine for one or two of the characters in the party to only have maybe even a plus one or plus two bonus, so they have some bump for the aura of protection and a little bit of a better spell saving throw DC. But I do think that there are certain paladin oaths that lend themselves better to really going hard on charisma. And possibly even, I think an interesting thing for this party to consider is not every paladin has to be a strength-based paladin. We could imagine some characters in the party not wearing heavy armor and going for a dexterity-based melee build, perhaps one that used a rapier and a shield, more of a duelist style, having a good dexterity score, maybe not you know, wearing no armor, but still having, say, a suit of half plate, a good dexterity, using that to attack with, and that might give a little bit more diversity to both the skills the characters bring to the table, as well as their armaments, weapons, and their other other choices. I, I do think, though, that when you are looking at four of the same class, that diversity is going to be important, not only in what your attributes are. If we have one person with maxed out charisma, one with maxed out strength, one with dexterity as high as they can get it, and then somebody else who's filling in whatever gaps needed. And then also, although sword and board is a very classic way to go with paladin, I think that our strongest frontliner or heavy hitter should maybe go with a two-handed weapon, mm -hmm. whereas some of the other paladins may actually be, be relying more on their spell casting than they are actually being a frontliner. Uh, so having that bit of diversity and knowing what role you're going to fill with your paladin is going to be an, imp an important part of an all-paladin party. Yeah, unfortunately, paladins don't have a lot of reason to invest much in their intelligence scores or, surprisingly, their wisdom scores either. None of their class features really key off of either of these things. Every paladin is going to want to have a decent or high constitution score. And one of the other weaknesses, though, of paladins is that while Divine Smite does a lot of damage you can't use it on ranged attacks so the lack of good ranged attacks could be a weakness for this party i think that 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 will be a standout weakness and when we look at like the strengths and weaknesses of this party that's probably one of the ones that we're going to want to talk about mm -hmm. with the number of different oaths that we can swear though what do we think both of us would talk about for building a well-rounded paladin party. There's some great oaths out there. There's some okay oaths. But also, I think that some of the less popular oaths might be more beneficial in an all-paladin party. In, indeed. And one of the things to note is that many of the oaths gain an aura feature at 7th level. And while the aura of protection doesn't stack, if we have different auras from different paladin subclass oaths those could potentially overlap with one another and so and they could build on the aura of protection in interesting ways so we might want to really consider carefully both what spells the different oaths are bringing to the table and what kind of aura effect they're offering those tend to be the standout things channel divinity tends to offer a couple interesting options but paladins have this weird gap in their progression in in fifth edition as written because they get their spells and their channel divinity at level three they get their oath boost they get their oath aura boost at level seven and then they don't get anything until level 15 and then nothing again till level 20. and so i find that when i'm looking at paladins the level 15 feature and the level 20 feature really don't carry a lot of weight for me for what they offer no, what what we want is a good channel divinity, a good spell list, and a good aura. The other stuff's just gravy. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the strongest auras that immediately comes to mind, and I think in, in a lot of conversations 
around the paladin is the Oath of the Ancients and their aura of warding. I think that the Oath of the Ancients offers a lot in terms of uh, protective capabilities. Yeah, because the aura of warding, when it applies, it halves the damage from spells that the party takes. And so your party members don't have to be benefiting from your aura of protection to be having the benefit of the aura of warding. So I could see our Oath of the Ancients being a very defensive-oriented character, one who invests a lot in their strength, their constitution, probably goes sword and board, and brings a little bit of nature magic to the table. Um, their channel divinity powers will let them abjure fey or fiends. They have a couple things that can let them entangle, but interestingly enough, they also bring things like tree stride and commune with nature and speak with animals, which is some interesting utility to the table too. I do think that the Ancients actually offers us some exploration capabilities that we don't find in many paladins. As well as with their entangling ability, they mm -hmm. offer a bit of control on the battlefield, which I think is going to be really beneficial for the paladins to land yeah. all of their attacks. Plus they have Moonbeam and Misty Step, which I think that this character could make a decent investment in their charisma if they wanted their Moonbeam to be very effective. And that Misty Step is just going to be some really critical utility. Paladins don't have a lot of mobility, so Misty Step adds a lot to it. I think I'll throw it out to the one that everybody expects us to pick. And yes, the Vengeance Paladin is going to make an appearance here. I do think that the Vengeance Paladin is going to be our star hitter. Yes. They're, they're the one who's going to be dealing the most damage. The Vengeance Paladin has a stacked spell list. There isn't a single spell on the spell list that you don't want to take. You're, you're getting your Misty Step. You're getting your Hunter's Mark, Haste, Bane. Uh, just being able to have Haste on a Paladin is unreal. And with a group of Paladins, my yeah. favorite thing here is when I was a Vengeance Paladin, and I had Bane, I still wanted Bless. But now because we have a whole group of Paladins, somebody can cast Bless on the party, and the Vengeance Paladin can, can, can cast Bane on the enemies, and you have a D4 minus and a D4 positive. Working That's a in your really favor. interesting swing. Although you might be tempted to not invest too heavily for your in your charisma again for the Vengeance Paladin here, because the Vengeance Paladin isn't actually bringing an aura to the table. Their seventh level feature lets them pursue enemies as a reaction that are trying to get away from them, which often their enemies are dead. I, I actually don't think I've seen this ability get used too many times. I think I, I think can... use it once in our entire yeah. one to eighteen campaign. It's not bad. It just doesn't come up as much as you would expect, especially when you do have a character that has Missy Step, Oath of Enmity, uh, the Vow of Enmity, sorry, and Dimension Door as well on the table, which I think is really important here. We bring Banishment to the table, we got Hold Monster, and we got Scrying. This character, I agree with you, this is where we're going to go with the pole arm or the Great arm, the great Weapon Master thing. This, this guy is just a missile yeah. that goes for whichever foe needs to come down first. If the Ancient is protecting us, the Vengeance is, is the sword. Yeah. Um, but then also beyond the Vengeance being the sword, we point him at the enemy and say go, and the enemy dies. There is another protection paladin that I want to bring in here. And I think it's going to be key to this build of this whole party, and that's the Redemption Paladin. Yes. The Oath of Redemption is an amazing team player and is a surprisingly good battlefield controller, healer, and all-round just amazing support. I think that because of the abilities that we get with the Redemption Paladin, this is our Paladin who's maxing charisma. Yeah. Because I think this is also the character that you go Dexterity on as so, well. So your Dexterity Charisma Paladin, they have the ability to bolster up their persuasion checks, which not useful in combat, but seeing as we're a group of Paladins, this Paladin becomes the face of the party. Yeah, totally. Th this character is going to be the face of the party, but it's also going to be a battlefield controller because they're going to be bringing spells like Hold Person, Sleep, Hold Monster, Hypnotic Pattern, Counter Spell. Yeah. Uh, and they eventually get Wall of Force. Um, and so really, this is going to be the party wizard. In a lot of cases, I think that this character's main thing, particularly once you get to ninth level and you get those third level spell slots, they're going to be the one that 
if there's going to be a spell that is going to get through all of the other defensive features, they're going to counterspell it. But otherwise, they're going to put that hypnotic pattern down and just let that Vengeance Paladin carve through all the other foes. There is also a case here that although we have incredible saving throws with this party and we have great spell resistance, the Redemption Paladin can soak up damage for the other party members and eventually bolster themselves back up. That's at higher levels. Yeah. But if we are playing a high level campaign, the fact that if one of your allies is going to go down, you have a number of ways to mitigate that. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of lay on hands here. Uh, there's also a lot of revivify happening. But if the Redemption Paladin wants to be like, I can eat that damage to save the day, they can do that. I'm really tempted to bring in a Conquest Paladin. I was going to bring in the Conquest Paladin because they're a great battlefield controller with their fear capabilities, their hold and dominate spells. Uh, they bring a lot to the table and they are, in my opinion, the second best Paladin Oath out there. But we're actually getting a lot of overlap with things that we're already bringing. And I think there's a stronger fourth choice. So I, I will throw it out there to the Conquest Paladin. If you throw them in the party, by all means, it works. But I think the Oath of the Watchers is a really unsung hero here. First of all, they're going to fix a small problem that this party has. In that, because we don't have good dexterity scores, it doesn't mean it means we don't have good initiative. But the Oath of the Watchers, their aura, adds proficiency modifier to initiative for the, for the party. And if this party can get a bolster to their initiative and go first... It matters a lot for it, it matters yeah, a lot. Yeah, the Paladin Nova really, it makes a big difference. But their other power is a Channel Divinity which gives a certain number of allies advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. This is going to stack with everything else we put on the table. So if we have our Aura of Protection, the Redemption Paladin is blasting out plus five on, yeah. their, on their Aura of Protection. So plus five to all of our saving throws. On top of that, the Ancient's Paladin is allowing us to take half damage on spells, and the Watcher's Paladin is saying, hey, we get advantage on our Wisdom, Charisma, and Intelligence saving throws. And that's a, it's such a perfect complement between the Ancient's and the Watcher, because a lot of spells that deal damage target Constitution and Dexterity saving throws. On the flip side, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma saving throws may or may not deal damage, but they often tend to have the nasty control effects that our paladins really don't want to suffer. So this party, you're never going to mind control them. You're never going to scare them. You are never going to trap them in a hypnotic pattern. And if they get fireballed, they're kind of like, whatever. Yeah, their, their worst saving throw is probably going to be dexterity if they have all of these things online. And even then, they can soak up a few fireballs before they care. And yeah. with so much healing spread out amongst them, they're they're fine. Yeah, because we've got lay on hands from everybody. And the paladins also all have access to aura of vitality. That is the third level spell, but it's a pretty big heal. We don't have healing word, which might be worth taking a feat to get healing word somewhere in the party. I, I will also mention with the Watchers, uh, adding them into the party, their spell list isn't the greatest, but they do offer another counter spell. And they have Sea Invisibility. Sea Invisibility, which is going to be very helpful. I find that the Watchers Paladin gives us sort of this build that says it's going to be hard to surprise these Paladins. Yes, and, and I think that is probably where we round out our nightly group. We have Watchers, we have Redemption... We have Vengeance, and we have Ancients. I think that this the motto for this group could be Redemption is our shield, Vengeance our sword. Guided by the Ancients, we watch ever, ever vigilant. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the oath. They've all sworn the same oath, but yeah. taken different manifestations of it. of it yeah one yeah. is the shield one is the sword one is the ancestor and one is the protector yeah. yeah um i i think that that can bring us all together into this and look at the strategies because in combat we've already talked about a lot of this but we are going to be invulnerable to spellcasters and this party i think the only thing you want to watch out for with this party 
is not everybody needs to use all of their smites on every attack in the first round of combat because you're going to get to a point where everything's already dead. But at the same time, if you want to all smite on the first round of combat, you're going to wipe the bosses off the table. Yeah. Uh, but if you have to go a little bit longer, I think that the party can be smart about things. Having someone put down Bless, having the Redemption Paladin putting down their Hypnotic Pattern, having a couple key hold monsters here and there, or banishments at higher levels, is going to give this party a surprise amount of battlefield control and once all the and of course if you're going up against fiends celestials or other creatures you'll all have your abjure enemies or turn the foes that you can put on top of that too and so despite this being a group of paladins the battlefield control is very strong yeah they each of them has their sort of abjure option um the the Watchers is the best, where you basically can turn anything. And then on top of that, I think it's Redemption has the ability to just ricochet damage back at a target. Totally. And and the resilience is so high that counterintuitively, this party can probably win a War of Attrition, and the resource cost to them is not very high. So as a group, you're going to be able to decide, all right, is this the, is this the battle that we need to end now? Or can we make our enemy face us in a battle of attrition that they're not going to win because we can withstand so much of what we put out? Break out the shields, slap on the heavy armor, everybody's standing on at least 20 AC. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, our Redemption Paladin might be our dex-based guy, but he's being protected by so much happening. Yeah. That it doesn't really matter. So I think combat is our strongest pillar of play with this party. And there's not much that can deal with four paladins novang on no. against them. There is a combat weakness, though. Ranged enemies and flying enemies. Yeah, if you're going up against a dragon and that dragon doesn't land, you can't smite it. You can throw javelins at it, maybe yeah. shoot it with your heavy crossbow. But that is the, the where the War of Attrition is going to take place. No. All of our characters do have fine steed and fine greater steed, so they could summon flying mounts. But if those mounts get roasted by the dragon, that's going to be a problem. And so I do think for this party, you might want to look for a couple tricks up your sleeve through feats, where perhaps even you just take martial adept so that you've got a couple battle master maneuvers to make trip attacks. Just anything that you can use to knock an enemy out of the sky. I could see the Redemption Paladin taking Spell Sniper to gain Eldritch Blast at a massive range. Yeah. Uh, because Eldritch Blast will use your Charisma, and as the top Charisma character... Because when you take Spell Sniper, you choose a School of Magic, and it applies to that ability score. And since mm -hmm. we're a Charisma caster, choosing yeah. Warlock might be beneficial. Yeah, Eldritch Adept... And meta magic adept could actually be interesting plays with these characters too to get like a quicken spell somewhere. I could see taking Fey Touched or Shadow Touch to bring in some interesting spells, or even just just taking Magic Initiate to get some cantrips uh, because these could add some really critical gap fillers. Just having some ranged cantrips from any class might be worth doing. Yeah. Now, I think that as we move on to the next pillar of play, which is exploration, this is why we have the Ancients Paladin. I do think that we fall down a few notches here. We're not yeah. the greatest explorer, but we do have things like tree stride and scrying and uh, speak with animals from, from the Ancients. But those are all pretty high level. And I feel like despite the fact that we have mounts and potentially flying mounts, we don't have a lot of long-range transportation. Our characters are going to be strong, but this party's really going to struggle with traps and puzzles. Yeah, they may be able to gain intel and track people, but as soon as they get into traps and puzzles, they're not the brightest, and they're not good at finding things or picking locks. I mean, yeah. they break down the they're, door. They're, yeah, they're just going to kick in the door. Like they're, This party is going to be about as subtle as a bag of hammers. This isn't the party that goes, sneaks in the back door. This is the party that kicks down the door and yells, no. we're a group of paladins and we're here to smite you. Yeah, and they're, they're not going to have a lot of wilderness survival skills. Like You could pick up a couple and, and hope that your DM is merciful, but if you're going into the jungle 
If you're playing two of Annihilation, I might not choose this party. <laughs> we're, we're relying on that Ancient's yeah. Paladin, and he's going to crumble under the weight of Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah. D despite the fact that Tomb of Annihilation has a lot of undead, I think that the jungle will just swallow this party whole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it, it is just a big challenge for them to deal with things like traps, wilderness survival. Yes, they've got a lot of healing. Yes, they have a lot of ways to resist poison. They're immune to diseases and things like that. But I just do really think that any time where the skills are going to come up is going to be a struggle there. And they don't have a lot of ways to gain the system. They do have to kind of play honestly. I do think this is why we need the Ancients Paladin, because at least that makes us not fumbling horribly. It gives you... It gives us... It's better than having nothing. It's better than nothing. Yeah. It's, 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 it's our, like, side salad. Yeah. Um, so we're able to at least survive exploration but if you stay in the city i think social interaction is going to be pretty safe for this party social interactions are a breeze because we're a charisma based party but then on top of that our redemption paladin who's the face of the party if we need to twist somebody's arm to get something done can use their channel divinity to add plus five to their already hefty persuasion check yeah and that's just going to get you into most situations so i actually think charisma based party with one character who can boost themselves up even further we're fine in social it's not as strong as we are in combat and i think there's actually like the old all bard party is probably oh, going yeah. to like destroy the all paladin party in social interactions but we're not suffering no, I think the biggest thing with social interactions is that we don't really have... Paladins do have Zone of Truth. Yeah. But we don't have a lot of the kind of manipulation magic. And we don't have anyone getting expertise. So we could take feats for some of those things. We could find ways to get Charm Person or, or Advantage or, or things like Enhance Ability and whatnot. But it does mean that we do have to sort of play the game honestly in... Well, really, the, the Paladins have to play it honestly everywhere. They're great at social interaction. They're great at combat. But as soon as tricks are required, as soon as you have to get crafty, I think you start seeing the limitations of the all-Paladin party. Well, the Paladins are, very, are a very straightforward group. Yes. They are, if they're talking to you, they're going to try to persuade you. Deception may not be their shtick. Uh, I mean, they could have it. They could have You it. could have the dexterity-based paladin that wears lighter armor and has acrobatics and stealth and has proficiency in these tools. That's going to be a gap filler. That's by, that is that is not a replacement for a rogue. That is not a replacement for a character that has invested in that. And, and, the, and you're going to be having to fill gaps. Infiltration is not their best. Their infiltration is, again, hey, we're here. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, there's, there's, I don't think there's anywhere where we can readily get invisibility or greater invisibility. I mean, we do take shadow touched and maybe we gain could. invisibility we there, could. but invisibility, and maybe we can somehow get past with our. Tri I don't know. I I think it's just a stretch. I think it's a real stretch to get to get it in there. I it's not impossible. It's but not, it's... but I think it's going to be it. You're going to be like, okay, I could get all these exploration abilities, but that's going to come at the expense of something else. Yeah. And maybe with an all paladin party, one or two characters do have the room to do that. Yeah, I, I think that it's obvious that combat is like our S tier option. I'd give us an A in social and maybe like a B or C in exploration. I think, I think it, it's a C for exploration for yeah. this party. They're not a D. No, they, can, they have they can... options. And and at the end of the day, like just the ability to, to for the entire party to mount up potentially on flying mounts, that can be a major exploration boon. But that's a very specific type of exploration scenario. That's getting from point A to point B quickly. We, yeah, it's going to help you get up a mountain up or up a cliff, but it might not necessarily help you survive in the jungle or it might not necessarily help you survive the puzzle or the trap filled dungeon and that's where we run into limitations and well some of the misty steps and dimension doors in the party can get us there i think it's also worth mentioning that these fourth and fifth level spells are not things that this party is going to have until 13th level and higher yeah and so and even things like hypnotic pattern and the control that's ninth level for paladins yeah so but and so it's just at the point where the really tricky stuff starts coming online that maybe not every problem is solved by smiting it. 
And that's a surprise because like most problems we can smite. You can solve a lot of problems by smiting it, but not every problem. I think that 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 kind of rounds out. I still think that this is a very strong all one class party. Oh yeah, and it's going to be amazing to role play. Whether you want to take it seriously with like your band of brothers feeling military unit yeah. of oath sworn warriors. Like I think that you could draw a lot of inspiration from real world militaries. Or real world nightly orders here. I also love there's there's a trope that happens in a lot of military movies. I'm also thinking of Star Wars. The Bad Batch is a great example of this. But so many times you see the band of military heroes, but each of them is like specialized. It's like this is Bob, our demolitions expert, and this is our sniper, and this is our hand to hand combatant, and like we don't quite get those archetypes. But the fact that you have these different oaths, you can kind of give them their own personality it's like the vengeance is the gruff warrior the ancients is like kind of the more holy yeah uh so you you get these like distinct personalities and distinct specialties within yeah. your band of military experts i think another kind of fun thing that you could see is everyone having their own individual heraldry you could have a very colorful car party i'm actually trying to resist saying they could be like the power rangers in their in their color scheme um, but you could even draw inspiration from, like, I'm thinking in Warhammer 40,000, there's organizations like the Death Watch, where space marines from different chapters are brought together in one elite organization. So you could have a world where maybe maybe everyone in your party is a paladin of a different knightly order or a god, but some organization has summoned together and be like, bring us the best of the best of the best. Well, we are making uh... a team. Th this could be the Avengers. If, if you the Holy have, Avengers. If you have a demon lord being summoned yeah. and the world finds out, they're not going to be like, yeah, we'll get our paladins. Forget yours. No, they're going to be like, everybody send yeah. in your best paladin. Yeah. We got a demon lord coming. And that's where this party forms. Is it's like each oath yeah. sends their greatest warrior to deal with the demon lord. Yes. Um, you also just could be questing knights. Yeah. Um, in a very Arthurian legend way. Like it could be you are the knights of the round table or the knights of the triangle table or the knights of the flower or whatever you want to call your group. And normally all the knights, they swear their own oaths. They come from their own walks of life. And usually they're on individual quests, but this happens to be one the, those times. You know, if you again to look at the, the, the Ur example of the knights of the round table, the quest for the Holy Grail. You're looking for the artifact. Some of them went out far flung. Some of them worked together. They all flowed in, in different ways. Or, you know, you could just rip off Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So then we get in the horse. <laughs> Wait, what? But that's an example of why the paladins are not good at problem solving. They build the horse. They give yeah. it to the to the castle. And then they take it in. They're yeah. like, now what? Well, now we jump out of the... No, it's... no, no. Yeah. No, no subtlety. No, no infiltration ability. <laughs> no. So you may end up as the Monty Python crew. Yeah. Um, beware just, the rabbits. Uh, just make sure you're careful with the holy hand grenade of Antioch and beware the beast of awe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you do come across a sorcerer in your travels, some call me Tim. Anyway. Um, yeah. We could go off on that. We, but, yes, we could. Uh, the fact is that you could, I think that like either having them all be from the same round table, having them be brought together like the Avengers to deal with a demon threat. And having all of them have a squire that runs behind them clapping coconuts. When you cast <laughs> Fine Steed. You actually only are summoning a squire with coconuts, but it makes you move faster. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you... Can your flying mounts, do they exceed the speed of a swallow? What kind of swallow? African or European. <laughs> um, we could also go the route of having our paladins. I, I'm thinking that like if they all swore an oath to the same god, like you did your little kind of rhyme earlier. Another struggle with this group? They might be witch hunters, but, you know, the, if their best test is weighing, weighing the witches against ducks. <laughs> she turned me into a newt. Okay, we're done with the Monty Python. No, but it's so great because it shows all the examples of their weaknesses. I mean, they weren't even good in combat either. What else floats? Small rocks. <laughs> 
I'm going home and watching Monty Python and the yeah. Holy Grail tonight. Um, if she floats, she's made of wood. <laughs> and therefore, she would weigh the same as, yeah, a duck. Not and, good reasoning. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the paladins could all be from the same god. And I'm thinking that this group that we've made could be of like a dwarven god of justice. Yes, right. Because like redemption and vengeance can be that the body that duality of balance right and i do think that there is something about the ancient watchers that yeah. resonates for me so you have these kind of two parts but i i liked your poem with like you have your sword your shield and you are the ancient watching over yeah and so like that's the god that you're swearing to the sword and shield ancient watching over things and so the vengeance embodies the sword the redemption embodies the shield the ancients embodies the the persona of the god and you know, the watcher is is the protector that you know what could be really cool though actually and because i mentioned power rangers earlier what could be really cool as a campaign form concept, the megazord not form the megazord Think of, like, these knights, they find an abandoned castle where there's a great spirit of an ancient paladin and their weapons and armor. And so these young knights find the, the ancient long-lost castle where the secrets of the order have been kept. They discover the weapons and armament. And, you know, in the same way that you have, like, the ancient advisor, that they swear their oath, they're given their weapons and armor, and over their quest they're they're both fighting the ancient enemy of this order because the the castle was made to watch over the demon lord for when it would come back but the but whole thing is that the, it's going to awaken and so the spirits of the old knights have called out to a new generation that they're going to that the spirits are going to guide the paladins to become the new order and there, and over the course of the campaign, you rebuild the castle, you rebuild the fortress, you recruit more knights into your order. Okay, but not only that, when they enter the castle, they find an ancient construct of the old religion <laughs> who helps them. Yes, an ancient. Uh, yes, there could be an ancient golem or something like that, and or there could be an angel that comes down and guides them and speaks to them and is kind of like their messenger as uh, well. And then on top of that, eventually you unlock crazy vehicles that all attach together. And, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, but you actually just made the Power Rangers mythos into like really cool D&D lore. And yeah. I think that's awesome. And your mounts could be different animals, which resonate with that too and you what what was the power rangers they could assemble all their weapons into like a ballista could they i, re I just yeah no no they, they did they had this this i remember this because as a kid i had the toys there were t all the power rangers had their different weapons but they could all build the weapons together into like this ballista laser cannon thing so there you you can they had a ranged attack magic weapons <laughs> for that can all be combined yeah uh I mean, there's a lot to play with. With So we got Monty Python, we got Power Rangers, we got Bad Batch or like Band of Brothers or whatever military you want to go with. Um, I I think that there's a lot to build a campaign around for yeah. a group of Power Rangers. Yeah, I re and the more I think about the idea of them, like, because I think of the image of the, the Power Rangers fortress, like it was on that sandy mountain with like that ancient sort of construction there. So imagine that as a castle, right? Yeah. And then Zordon, instead of being like this weird spirit, could actually be the angel. And this is the, like the gods are distant. So this is the only place the angel is allowed to come down to advise the party. So then you also got your construct that's Alpha 5. He's mildly annoying, but he, he helps you. could be like a lantern. There, there's a couple different archons and angels and celestials that are kind of like floating construct things too. Yeah. So he could be like the the last archivist that was there. And he, yeah, he's he's yeah. he's the archivist who's at the castle who helps maintain. He's almost like as you're going out and questing, he's the one like helping rebuild yeah, exactly. and, and set yeah. things up for yeah. your for your. Oh yeah, and then you all have your own oaths, and your mounts all are different, slightly different creatures that all symbolize. That are your symbol that is worn on your heraldry. That's cool. I like that campaign a lot. I actually think the Power Rangers campaign is the winner here because if you if you boil it down, yeah, and separate it from the fact that like Power Rangers is a little goofy. I loved it as a kid. But, oh yeah. 
But like if you boil it down to its core essence, it's a great D&D campaign. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. It works really simple for a monster of the week format with a recurring villain. And that's the way that you could go with it. An ancient evil has awakened and is summoning its old minions and or creating new monsters. And so every week it falls to the paladins to go out and defeat them. And then eventually you're going to build up to defeating that ancient sorceress or that ancient lich which both of those work really well for the vil- the original Power Rangers villains too. Yeah. So I think that is a great group of ideas. What is your overall ranking for the Paladin party? Okay. My heart tell I want to give the Paladin party S tier. But the fact of the matter is their weaknesses in exploration and their their very pointed combat weaknesses. I think do bring them down. An A feels right. They're going to Nova so many things. Yeah. But then, like in Monty Python, they're going to fumble with infiltration. I think that in this, when you start, as we start comparing to other classes and things like that, the big advantage that they have over, say, the wizards is a lot of resiliency. Yeah, and I think the big advantage that they have over clerics is they do a lot more damage yeah. than than the clerics do. But I think that in both cases, the paladins do find that there's a narrower band of things that they can tackle. If all they have to do is fight evil, they will excel. But evil takes many forms, and evil doesn't fight fair. And that's the thing that undermines the Paladin Party. If they're in a political intrigue espionage campaign... I think they lose. They, they just lose. lose so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but if they're in like a combat-heavy campaign, like absolutely S tier. Yeah. But, but yeah. that's what they're built for. And, and I think that's actually kind of the classic trope, too. Like You do see that a lot in many of these stories. Like Even to a certain extent, Game of Thrones shows it with Ned Stark, where he tries to be honorable. He's a great warrior doesn't matter when you're playing the political game. You get undermined because there's always going to be someone that's willing to go the dirty route, go the underhanded route. And even when paladins are willing to do it, they don't have the same skill set. So if you've played an all paladin party or have a different all paladin party that you'd bring to your table, tell us about it in the comments below. The videos that we create on their, on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work we do here on YouTube and want to get on our Discord to chat with us about your favorite party compositions, follow the links down below. And if you want to see us playing in the worlds of Drakenheim, you can check out our live play every Tuesday evening on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more content on build guides for 5th edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.